You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. Welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I am your furry host, Abraham. And I will be your host with Luscious Locks, Shane. That was, he, you guys can't see, but Shane did such a nice hair flip. I also realized I just ruined it for myself. If we ever do an episode on furries, I've already now called myself a furry. Host. Uh, we'll, we'll get there one day. Yeah. Probably nobody will remember anyway. So <laughs> that's fine. Maybe I've reused some, who knows at this point, we should just do a series of episodes on like misunderstood groups. Like I feel like furries could be in there. Juggalos could be in there. Oh man. Yeah. That is fun. I like that. Yeah. Anyway, welcome to our podcast. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're a science and psychology comedy podcast duo of we strength are. and fun and amazingness. Mm-hmm. So if you're joining us for the first time, we have an unexpectedly heavy episode to talk about. Yeah. Especially coming off the abortion episodes. Yeah. So we wanted to talk about hair and it actually turns out we have a lot we could possibly say about hair. You would think, Mm -hmm. what does hair have to do with psychology or anything? And it turns out a lot. And as a matter of fact, (laughs) today we're going to be talking primarily about hair as it relates to issues of race, particularly in the United States. But we also realized there's talking about hair as it relates to different cultures and how Mm -hmm. there is like cultural traditions around hair hair around gender norms, Mm -hmm. how hair has been used culturally, historically. You think about like people wearing those big wigs. Yeah. That was like the wig party, you know? Yeah. And the evolution of it. Like there's just so much to talk about in this space. It's kind of impressive. So anyway, today we are talking about hair as it pertains to race, particularly in the United States, particularly with respect to darker skinned people of African descent. Yes. So we are talking about black hair. It's worth noting that, like, you know, I don't know if you all have seen us, but we're uh, two uh, middle-aged white guys. I don't know if we're quite middle-aged yet. <laughs> so, like, I, feel, I feel like I just got aged up real quick. <laughs> I don't know that we're that we're there, but I do think every now and again we'll come across a topic. A lot of times, for those of you who don't know, we will pick a topic and we'll be like, that sounds interesting to talk about. Having no idea what the body of work or anything that goes along with that most of the time of the time. Right. So we just did the abortion episodes. Those are pretty heavy. A lot to unpack within that. Hair was going to be kind of like a fun one. We were like, yeah, we'll talk about like, you know, all the stuff. And it really turned into this bigger thing. So we're probably going to do a series uh, of different hair episodes. Yeah. Uh, much like we do with the sleep episodes. It's worth kind of unpacking different aspects of this. But this one is specifically about black hair you know we'll we'll call the series about hair so nouns of plurality like a gaggle of geese that sort of thing Mm -hmm. i think we'll call the series of hair a tangle a tangle i like that a tangle of hair i do enjoy that so anyway (laughs) if you would like to support the show you can join us on patreon you can subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts tell a friend rate and review buy some merch donate you know whatever (laughs) those sorts of things so anyway We'll talk more about that at the end of this episode. For now, let's go ahead and get into this. As we said, we're we're primarily talking about black hair. And as we also said, we're primarily white. This was scripted and recorded by three white people. Uh And so we sort of narrowed it down to this particular topic. Before we even jump into this, though, I really wanted to point out some fun things unrelated to hair. We're going to get to that. Mm -hmm. But today, uh, the, the day that this is being published, it is Embrace Your Geekness Day. So here we are. Here we are. So if you uh, (laughs) just embrace your inner geek, whatever that means to you, go out into the world and wear it on your sleeve. This is also International Rock Day, not as it pertains to music, but maybe like as it pertains to geology. So Mm -hmm. if you're (laughs) into rocks, I guess that's what it is. If you're in the Scorpion, the Scorpions, the band like, you know, Rocky Mm. Like a Hurricane, I guess you could appreciate that, too. But it's just a different day. May as well. Right. Yeah. Like for we're celebrating. It's a theme for Rock Day. Yeah, let's just celebrate all, all kinds of rock. Dwayne The Rock Johnson. We'll support <laughs> exactly. <you know? laughs> the movie The Rock. <laughs> yeah. yeah they, well, well, excellent. Excellent <laughs> exemplars. <laughs> so it's also French Friday, which I mean, come on, we can yeah. get on board with this, right? Fully support that. And then for the month, July is actually National Plastic Free Month, and it's also National Ice Cream Month. So get your plastic free ice cream and embrace your inner geek while eating French fries and you'll be living it up. I feel like you could do all of that at Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> I don't know their, their policy on plastic, but yeah, definitely a lot of it, at least. 
I think they try to avoid it. I mean, there's wooden spoons at the ones in Daytona, so. Fair enough. Yeah. Who to thunk like it? Who to thunk it? Bunch of hippies. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get back to talking about hair. <laughs> yeah. So, as we mentioned before, we're going to do a mini series on hair. So, we will get to that. A tangle. A tangle, if you will. Second note we'd like to share is that we welcome a continued discussion and feedback on this. This is one of those topics that is heavy. And that we are likely going to miss the mark on some things. So it is definitely one thing that we want to continue to open the discussion. We will share comments. We will share discussions. We will share that feedback that we get as well. So if you have any additional commentary, additional resources, additional discussion points that you'd like to share, feel free to reach out to us at info at www.wwdpodcast.com. Reach out to us. Let us know. Give us some feedback. We appreciate the labor that you share in making sure that we are covering this in a way that's comprehensive and thorough and, and does it justice. No. Food for thought, maybe like stoner thought, but still food for thought. Shane, have you ever thought about how weird it is that humans as a species are one of those few species where we just grow this little hair garden out of one part of our body and it seems to just grow indefinitely longer and longer and longer? Like the only other thing I can think of that's similar to that is horses. Yeah, it's weird, right? It's very strange. And then it's very strange. If you're on the male end of the spectrum, you also are are more likely to be able to grow hair, not off just the top of your head, but also at the bottom of your head, just off mm-hmm. the chin, bottom of your face region. So you just got these two protrusions of, of hair garden that will just go like they just grow without stopping. Yeah. Apparently hair is a weird thing. I mean, I look like cousin it right now. For those of you who can't see me because I just have hair all all over every part of my head. <laughs> so like I should be going. <laughs> That's really what I would imagine I sound like. But yeah, it's a weird it's a weird thing. And it's weird that horses also have that. Although you could see Shane if you join us on Patreon because we publish the, the video of us recording these episodes there. That's true. All right. So let's start talking then, as I mentioned, we're, we're really bringing in race and how hair pertains to or we're talking about black hair here. So there's sort of a series of questions to ask. And one of them is like, when and why did Afro textured hair begin being discouraged in this country? We're also going to kind of unpack what things have black Americans done to their hair to promote whiteness and different things uh, that go on there. We're also going to talk about ways that natural black hair is politicized. And we're going to include some examples of different circumstances that have resulted in politicized black hair. Related to that is what are the historical events that have led black people to feel empowered to wear their hair more naturally, which also has to do with politicization Mm -hmm. of hair. Yep. We're also going to talk about in what ways Afro textured hair has been discriminated against and what are ways that type of hair is being discouraged. And we're going to share some examples of how hair has shaped pop culture over time and why, um, you know, I never had dreadlocks. (laughs) Incidentally, I'm going to announce this now that we have been talking about this for a long time. We're going to start releasing or we're going to at least try a format of what we're going to call mini episodes that are just really quick, short discussions, like 15 minutes long, probably. And one of them is about shampoo. Mm -hmm. So related to hair. And so part of that tangle, (laughs) part of the tangle. That's right. (laughs) You know, a tangle has long strands and it's going to have some shorter strands. There's all kinds of stuff going on there. Exactly. That's what we're saying. All right, let's get into some background about Afro textured hair. Yes. So many cultures in Africa developed hairstyles that define status or identity in regards to age ethnicity, wealth, social rank, marital status, religion, fertility, adulthood, and death. So hair had a lot of different meetings and different styles had signals for different types of status. Yeah. And I think that'll probably be true when we talk about hair around in different cultures in the world too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, hair was carefully groomed by those who understood the aesthetic standard as the social implications of hair grooming were a significant part of the community life. And so hair was dressed according to local culture and customs. And I think that that is relatively consistent and and has maintained today as well. And so dense, thick, clean and neatly groomed hair was something highly admired and sought after. And hair was usually dressed according to the local culture, which we mentioned. It's interesting that that persists, right? Nobody's going, I want really thin hair. Typically, people want really dense, thick, clean and, and neatly groomed hair. Now, traditionally, hair grooming was a social event, which is kind of an interesting way of thinking about this. And I think there's definitely been some stereotypes about sort of like black barbershops and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Probably that that was a safe place to have social events in certain parts of the United States and certain parts of history. But anyway, so this this grooming hair was a social event where women could socialize and strengthen bonds with other women and their families. And I think probably there are some examples of there also being a place where men would socialize with one another Mm -hmm. and sort of their own little space. And then there's probably a co-ed, if you will, type environment that was somewhat similar. 
Yeah. And so hair braiding was historically not a paid trade. So this was, again, like a social gathering, social context. It was just something you did as part of like the community. And actually hair braiding itself was a style worn by men in modern Senegal and the Gambia. But in the 20th, 21st centuries, it has developed as a multi-million dollar business in the U.S., South Africa and Western Europe. So hair braiding was once maybe had some utility to it. And now it has become a fashionable thing. So that's all sort of just some general background So let's get into some history here, particularly as it relates to in the United States, how how this has been treated. And there's kind of a lot to unpack here. Mm -hmm. So one of them, as we mentioned in the question to ask is where and when does the sort of negative viewpoint of Afro textured hair derive, historically speaking? Obviously, one of the main ways that we're going to talk about this is how it pertains to slavery in the United States. And up until there was slavery the views of Afro textured hair were mostly positive or at least neutral when viewed in sort of written history. And so, you know, looking at one person's account of this, Alvise, this is a person's name, by the way. Yeah. Alvise Catamosto, maybe. Yeah. Catamosto or Catamosto. 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 Yeah, so, <laughs> something like that. This is a slave trader and explorer in the 1400s wrote that with the hair of African people, they quote, weave and tie their hair in neat tresses, end quote. And transatlantic slavery didn't exist yet. At this point, hair was not considered ugly or inferior in any way. That would come more with some of the more, I think, institutional racism that accompanied slavery. So it's worth taking some time to talk about slavery and how this impacted hair. And so during slavery, the hair of black people was compared to animals. And so this is an unfortunate thing. Um, This is something that shouldn't have happened. But it was one of the ways that white people justified the treatment of black people and dehumanized them at this time. And the term that was often used during this time for Afro textured hair was the term woolly, which is, again, unfortunate. Yeah, it's not unlike in our. In our intelligence episode, we discussed how essentially white people would go to great lengths to try and prove why people of darker skin were inferior. And they always came up empty handed because, of course, that's a nonsense hypothesis to begin with. Mm -hmm. But yes, dehumanizing them in every conceivable way. And one of them was hair. And so that what that meant also is that black slaves that had more European texture to their hair were often treated better or given more opportunities than those with more traditional sort of Afro textured hair. Now, Africans that were captured as slaves didn't have the resources to groom their hair as they had had in Africa. So they adapted the best they could by any means. And so they would use sheep fleece tools, applying kerosene or cornmeal directly to their scalp to disinfect and clean their scalps and often end up shaving their hair and wearing hats to protect their scalp. Because if you are not familiar with the living conditions of many, many slaves, it was not great. Those resources simply did not exist or were never provided or were taken away. Yeah, all the bad things, basically. All the bad things. Every bad thing that could have happened was happening. Yeah, just any way to make life more miserable for those people. Mm -hmm. So during the 19th century, hair styling became more popular and imitate white straight hair. Oftentimes, slave would use various agents to try and, and style the hair, such as lard, butter, goose grease. And that would allow them to attempt to moisturize their hair, straighten in some way. They would use hot butter knives to curl their hair and to straighten the hair, they'd use a mixture of lye, egg and potato. And if anybody knows anything about lye, it is a caustic chemical. So Mm -hmm. it would often using these mixtures would sort of burn their scalp uh, when they're trying to straighten their hair to look more like European hair. Yeah. Now, it's important to note the rationale for why this was happening. They weren't doing it because of anything other than they were being mistreated, uh, partially mistreated for their hair that was like a a pain point so if they could eliminate that that ammunition then they might have been treated a little bit better and so it makes sense that that they would try to kind of adapt to to reduce the amount of aversives that were coming to them if they could quote unquote change their hair then that was one less thing that was used against them all right so getting into the 1920s through the 50s and, and sort of into the 60s after the civil war and emancipation Many African-Americans moved to the city where they were influenced by new styles, get sort of a new cultural milieu, if you will. And in these situations, many chose to lighten their hair. And of course, again, they were trying to straighten their hair. And this is to conform to sort of more Anglo-European white ideals of beauty. 
And so, of course, then they're using these caustic chemicals to try and do these things to their hair. And the black hair industry was initially dominated by white owned businesses. But over time, there were many African-American or black entrepreneurs who became big players in the beauty industry. And so what ends up happening over time is a lot of black owned businesses start to pick up and they start to develop products and different tools that are specific for Afrocentric hair. As it should be. Absolutely. So black owned businesses in the hair care industry provided jobs for thousands of, uh, of black Americans. And these business owners gave back strongly to the black community. During this time, hundreds of African Americans and black Americans became owner operators of successful beauty salons and barber shops, which become an important part of the community. And in the 1930s, conking became an innovative method in the United States for black men to straighten hair and women would wear wigs. So again, we get sort of this approach to, again, trying to adhere to what might be considered white beauty standards, the sort of dead lifeless hair look. <laughs> which, which you know, that's what, what I'm going for right now. <laughs> Corpse hair. Yeah. Ooh, ooh. Well, let's talk about some hair, as particularly when we start seeing a shift in the civil rights movement. But we'll do that after we get back from a message from these hair care sponsors for white people. OK, so we're we're back and we're talking about hair as it relates to the shift in cultural preference during the civil rights movement. Absolutely. So during the civil rights movement, you had a lot of very noteworthy groups and folks. You had, you know, people like Malcolm X, you had Martin Luther King, you had Rosa Parks, you had the Black Panthers. And, and all of these folks were hugely influential on the community at large, let alone the black community. Now, in the 60s and 70s, the black pride movement made the Afro a popular hairstyle among African-Americans and was considered a symbol of resistance. In 1964, the U.S. federal government passed the Civil Rights Act, which prevented discrimination based on race, but it was left to interpretation by the courts as to what that meant. And you'll see that that still occurs, unfortunately, that some people will say they'll use professionalism as a way to dis to discriminate in those spaces. Yeah, these sort of secret code guarded terms to do racist things without calling them racist things. Mm -hmm. So as an example, in 1970, Beverly Jenkins was denied a promotion in the Blue Cross by her white supervisor due to her hair, which was in an in, in afro. And in 1976, federal court case Jenkins v. Blue Cross determined that Afros were, in fact, protected by Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. However, the case did not extend protections against hair discrimination. And as we can see how things are currently going in the United States at the time that we're recording this, I think it's very possible that they would make it so that businesses can discriminate on the basis of hair and race again. That seems really mm -hmm. in keeping with their current opinions. Yeah, which is unfortunate. And also, too, I would like to point out that if you look at any pictures of like also a bunch of white men during the 70s, they also had afros. And I can't imagine that they were denied jobs. I mean, all you got to do is look at Bob Ross. <laughs> Let's be candid for a moment, right? That's fair. So during the height of the civil rights movement, Afro textured hair was at its, quote, height of politicization. And wearing an Afro was an easily distinguishable physical expression of black pride and the rejection of social norms. So black activists at this time infused straightened hair with political valence to wear one's hair straight in an attempt to simulate whiteness came to be seen by some as an act of self-hatred and a sign of internalized oppression imposed by the white dominated mainstream media and portrayals and sort of popular culture. Natural hair became a symbol of pride, but it also fueled the controversy and many opposed natural hair for its aesthetics and ideology. It caused tensions between black and white communities, as well as more conservative African-Americans or black Americans. So there's this idea of like black is beautiful. And Angela Davis wore her Afro as a political statement and started a movement toward natural hair. And this movement influenced a generation, including celebrities like Diana Ross, whose Jerry Curls took over in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. I am one of those white people there for a white person, very curly hair. And I know that sometimes some people have referred to them as being Jerry Curls. Interesting. I would not have done that myself, but yeah, okay. I don't have curly hair, so I don't understand that. <laughs> I didn't didn't choose either the curly hair or the, or the name for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's, it's been imposed upon you. Yeah. Pretty curly for a white guy. With all that being said, I mean, a lot of that stuff, I mean, you can see just even in like these major historical movements that hair itself has become politicized and has not only become an 
external kind of stressor onto the black community, but it has also become an internal black community fight as well. I mean, we brought up the idea like, you know, straightened hair and quote unquote promoting whiteness right. becomes kind of an internal struggle within the black community as well. So it's important to know and kind of mention that right now as we go into some current events that hair is in itself a, a major, major talking point in the community in general, but it's important though its impact on the black community specifically. And actually, you know, a while back when we had a guest on talking about anti-racism and she commented that when she was, I think, in middle school or something, felt like she wanted to have straight hair because that's, you know, what all the pretty white girls had, the straight hair. And so the, it is something that continues to this day. And the style of kinky hair, the sort of curly kinky hair continues to be this politicized in contemporary American society is exemplified by that and other things. And we're in a space now where it's just... A very sensitive space. It's a charge, a sort of highly charged space about how one's hairstyle is, I think, a representation of one's identity and what that means for what they're saying with their identity in terms of how they wear their hair, which is kind of like a large burden mm-hmm. to carry. Now, I mean, I guess everybody sort of makes a choice about what they want to eat, how they want to use their hair in a particular way. But to feel like you're pressured to do so because you were born in a way that is for some reason taboo or seen as like, a, ooh, better do something about that sort of thing. And I'm like, that's just silly, I think. Yeah. I mean, silly is a, a very gentle way of putting it. Yeah. There'd be more swearing if this was not a family friendly show. <laughs> yeah, it's uh it's unfortunate. There you go. It's unfortunate that, that is a thing that has to be carried by marginalized groups. Now, whether an individual decides to wear their hair in its natural state or they decide to alter it, black hairstyles convey a message. In several post colonial societies, the value system promotes quote white bias and quote ethnicities are valorized according to the tilt of whiteness, which functions as the ideological basis for status ascription. End quote. Basically, what's happening is, is that, you know, this white bias is influencing a larger community and a large group. And it's actually shifting some of the things that that the community itself will value. We talked about white beauty standards before. And so hairstyles will start to conform to those white beauty standards, unfortunately. So these what you might think of as being sort of these African American or just, you know, African related elements whatever they might be, that might be the, the cultural elements that might be sort of the style, that sort of thing. These are then sort of issued into a category of low social status or low importance, or I guess regarded not as favorably as something like European elements in hair, where these were sort of symbolized and enabled upward mobility, if you will, for a sort of ascending by adhering to those sort of standards of beauty and style. Absolutely. And so what ends up happening is this value system is created and it's reinforced by a system that is inherently racist. So systemic racism will reinforce this value system of whiteness. It's not usually explicit. I mean, there is pretty explicit examples of it, but it's not somebody outright going like, oh, you have really good white hair. It's usually like the beauty standards are and this is where representation comes in and all that. And those beauty standards are set to, to this value system in that systemic racism type of space. And so what ends up happening is, is racism works like this. Racism works by encouraging the devaluation of self-identity by the victims themselves. And that recenters the sense of pride as a prerequisite for politics of resistance and reconstruction. So basically what that means is that the marginalized group is made to feel less than the value system. It excludes them from that value system. And so ultimately what ends up happening is racism works to essentially create an internalized hatred within the group themselves and try to move towards other standards that are not part of that group's identity instead of celebrating the differences and the diversity within that group. And so all this sort of means that by wearing hair as it naturally grows instead, individuals with the curly, the sort of kinky hair, they were, they were taking back their agency mm-hmm. and they were then they had the ability to decide the value and the politics of their own hair. So it's just returning this back to that domain or at least an attempt to do so. And that's essentially the political statement that was being made. Yeah. Now, wearing one's hair naturally also opens up a new debate. And that this is part of the complexity that this is why you see why, as we kind of dig into this, why this episode was so complex. Right. Because there's so much to to kind of unpack. So 
wearing one's hair naturally opens up a new debate. Are those who decide to still wear their hair straightened, for example, are they less black or less proud of their heritage than those who decide to wear their hair naturally? And this debate is an often ongoing topic of discussion within the community. This is not an external debate on our end. This is something that's happening within the community. And the issue is highly debated and disputed, creating almost a, a social divide within the community between those who decide to be natural and those who do not. This has a sort of a corresponding mirror, I think, if you look at other instances where there have been other groups who were treated unfairly, inequitably, and often poorly. And I'm thinking about how this also reflects things like some of the uh, standards that were put upon women. And specifically thinking about there was a movement for women, I mean, guess of all races, but, uh, you know, thinking about the United States, women to, that is still very common, to shave a lot of parts of their body. So they're not having hair on their legs, on their arms, and their armpits, and that sort of thing. And so there was this whole movement of like, well, let's like not shave anything and just grow hair naturally. Mm -hmm. And then it was seen like, OK, so if you choose to shave and like adhere to those standards and, and you know, take all the hair off of your body, except in certain places, then you're essentially saying that what women grow naturally is is incorrect or bad. But then it sort of morphed into and that's, this is where the parallel, I think, exists this thing like, well, but women can choose to do either of those things, right? They And so like where men have kind of always had the choice, particularly white men could do anything and be like, yeah, that's, that's whatever. Like, like they get to have that agency for women. It was this. And for, for black people is this roller coaster of like, you know, first it's being told what's supposed to be appropriate and then trying to adhere to that or trying to rail against it, then deciding, well, we want things to just be natural and who we are. And then being like, well, but we could also choose to have, you know, have our own standards and our own agency. And it's, I don't know. I I feel like I see a sort of parallel in the emergence of those two things. And it's, again, it's complicated because there are differing values around what, it means to be black and proud. There are different values around what it means to be part of a, a larger community. Like it, it's, it's a really complex thing to unpack. I mean, it, this is not, this is just the tip of the iceberg folks. Yeah. Like we haven't even really unpacked all of it yet. I mean, with the emergence of hip hop culture and Jamaican influences like reggae music, more non-black people have begun to wear these hairstyles. So you'll see white folks wearing black hairstyles and a new market has developed in such hair products like so there are hair products called like quote unquote out of Africa shampoo, which is kind of emerging out of this hip hop and reggae culture. Love that. Uh huh. So in an article, Rooks in 1996 argues that hair care products designed to straighten hair, which have been marketed by white owned companies in African-American publications since as far back as the 1830s. Mm-hmm. That this represents unrealistic and unattainable standards of beauty and not even like that, but like also ridiculous that those should be regarded as standards of beauty and that people should then be expected to adhere to them because they reflect a totally different cultural and like set of ancestry and and traditions out of a different part of the world. Right. And sales of relaxers took a great fall. Relaxers being, you know, these hair products meant to straighten hair. These started to decrease among African-American women from 2010 to 2015. And many of the African women gave up using these products to go back to instead the sort of natural hairstyle, their natural roots, if you will. Celebrities like Esperanza Spalding, Janelle Monet, and Solange Knowles have worn more natural looking hairstyles with respect to not, I guess, putting that kind of product in their hair. Yeah. And you see that too. Like I've seen that in like some superhero movies too, like Domino from Deadpool two. Yeah. That costume design was great. So like I'm right. fully in support. Zazie beats. Yeah. She's great. She's wonderful. Now during the 19th century throughout the West Indies, the teachings of Jamaican political leader, Marcus Garvey encouraged an active rejection of European standards of beauty. The resulting Rastafari movement of the 20th century has maintained that the growth of free form dreadlocks is related to spiritual enlightenment, largely informed by the biblical Nazarite oath. Now the Rastafari, movement has been so influential in the visibility and subsequent popularity of dreadlocks throughout the Caribbean and in global African diaspora that the term Rasta has become synonymous with the with a dreadlocked individual. So we're not going to unpack some of the unique challenges of Rastafarianism at this point. That's a different conversation yeah. along the lines of like any sort of biblical unpacking. So we'll we'll do that on a different episode, I am sure, at some point in time. We definitely should. Yeah. If that's yeah. the list. Yeah. Crown Act in 2019 in California, essentially this prevents discrimination based on hairstyle and hair texture by extending protection under the FEHA and the CA educate the California, CA being California, the the California Education Code 
and more than a dozen states have passed similar laws. Now, in March 2022, the House passed the Crown Act, which would ban hair related discrimination. And the Biden administration says that it looks forward to working with Congress to pass this bill in the very near future. That means everyone can wear mohawks now. Mm -hmm. It's about time. All right, let's get into talking about some more pop culture and other ways that hair has been used politically after we take a quick moment to hear from some capitalists. All right, so let's get into talking about some ways that, again, hair has sort of shown up in popular media, I think, is a way to sort of break out how this has also been affected by perceptions of hair and hairstyle. In 1971, Melba Tolliver, a WABC TV correspondent, made national headlines when she wore an afro while covering the wedding of Trisha Nixon Cox, daughter of President Richard Nixon. The station threatened to take Tolliver off the air until the story caught national attention. That was actually a really big moment. That was a really important moment for black hairstyles. So on April 4th, 2007, this is only 15 years ago, it seems like a really long time now that I say it out loud, but like in recent history, like we're not talking about like back in the seventies, right? Mm-hmm. Radio talk show host, Don Anus or Emmis maybe, <laughs> referred to the Rutgers university women's basketball team who are playing in the women's NCAA championship game as a group of quote, nappy headed hoes. I know. Right. Sorry. I had to even repeat that out loud that they left a very gross taste in my mouth during his morning show. His producer, Bernard McGurick, compared the game to, quote, the, oh my God, I hate saying this. I'm not going to repeat what they said because they're horribly racist terms that are stupid. All right. He compared this game to, insert racist slur here, alluding to Spike Lee's film School Days. Now, I miss, or Imus, or Anus, apologized two days later after receiving widespread criticism, rightfully so, and CBS Radio canceled his morning show a week after the incident. So this is on April 12th, 2007, firing both him and his producer, McGurk. So good. There's at least that, I guess. Sad that even had to happen. But there it is. Yeah, it's it's just absurd. So in 2015, Stacia L. Brown wrote a book called My Hair, My Politics. And it speaks on many personal and professional accounts of her Afro or natural hair being a barrier for her. Stacia also incorporated examples of workplace discrimination toward black hairstyles. She recalls how, quote, the Congressional Black Caucus took the U.S. military to task for its grooming policies, which barred cornrows, twists and dreadlocks, end quote. Stacia followed up with another example from the same year in which the Transportation Security Administration, TSA, in the United States, has, quote, come under fire for disproportionately patting down black women's hair, especially their afros, end quote. She continues saying how, quote, it's a practice TSA only agreed to stop a few months ago when the agency reached an agreement with ACLU of Northern California, which had filed a complaint in 2012, end quote. I've seen this happen. I've gone through enough play. I've seen this happen pretty consistently, and it's still a a practice that is unfortunately occurring. And how often are they digging into the cargo shorts, you know? Right. That That's the real, the real danger. Yeah. Which are almost always filled with guns. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the, the guy that looks like Kid Rock should be getting patted down way more often. Yeah. That guy is like effectively trying to tear things down from the inside like a cancer. Yeah, exactly. All right. So that was back in 2015. In 2016, the article Beauty is Violence, Beautiful Hair and the Cultural Violence of Identity Erasure discussed a study that was conducted at a South African university using 159 African female students. Tox Oyedemi, I hope I am saying that correctly, author of this article, spoke on these findings as, quote, evidences the cultural violence of symbolic indoctrination that involves the perception of beautiful hair as mainly of a European slash Asian texture and style and has created a trend where this type of hair is associated with being beautiful and preferable to other hair textures. In this instance, natural African hair End quote. Mm-hmm. So again, people sort of taking notice and, and stepping up to like the double standard that's being enforced here. Yeah. Now, this is something that you and I can agree on for many reasons. Mm -hmm. This entry in popular culture has to do with Black Panther, the movie. This was an iconic. This was a really important moment in black history. And so uh, in 2018, this movie was released and the release was monumental for so many reasons. For the first time, an actual Hollywood movie was produced where the entire cast of women wore their naturally Afro-American hair. So they wore their hair naturally. I mean, they they had costume designs and stuff, but they were designed around their natural hair and not around a whole lot of other expectations or standards. And still 
and I'm not even just saying this, like this is this is literally legitimately been true since 2018. This is still my favorite Marvel film to date. Really? Your favorite? It's my favorite. I mean, it's incredible. There's some like really high up there. I thought Infinity War was great. I obviously thought that Spider-Man No Way Home was amazing and Shang-Chi was amazing. But Black Panther is still just keeps hanging on to my top favorite spot. It was a really incredible moment to see. Like, I was really happy for the black community to have that because it was really cool to go to the theater and, and see how many folks were coming out to see that movie. Well, and and I think for me, it had one of the best villains. It had one of mm-hmm. the best arcs. It had like the coolest growth story for the hero. Yeah. It had Chadwick Boseman, which is so sad that he's not with us anymore. I loved so much about it. Like there were obviously the, like things that I think were not some of the effects, particularly like the CG rhinos were a little silly at points and like the final battle. Anyway, we're not getting it. We're not talking about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're, not, we're actually here to critique it. Anyway, I just love the movie. I feel like it's for um, um, the story. The movie worked really well. So and all that yeah. is to say mostly why I think it's relevant is a lot of people felt like they couldn't make a movie and have these traditional things in them because people wouldn't like it. I'm like, all you have to do is tell a good story. And I think you just prove that if you tell a good story, because that movie made so much money. Absolutely. And I mean, and it was impactful. I mean, it really like, it showed that you could with a good story still honor the black community. And I think they did a really great job of that. Exactly. Yes. Okay. That was much more succinct than how I rambled about it. (laughs) I know. I think we're, we're there. We're on the same page. All right. We have a few more interesting tidbits here. Andrew Johnson, a New Jersey high school student, was forced to cut his hair during a wrestling match. An investigation found the referee guilty of discrimination and was suspended for two years. The video of this was viewed over a million times on YouTube. So I got very publicized and sort of made the news. Yeah. And this was a really recent event, like within the last year. Right. And so I think it's important to note that like this type of thing that we're talking about is still occurring and still happening on a day to day basis. I mean, probably for people who are paying attention to the news, that probably doesn't come as a surprise, given like how things are currently going in this country. But Mm -hmm. anyway, yes, it is still it is still very much a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the conk was a major plot device in Spike Lee's film biography, Malcolm X, based upon Malcolm X's own condemnation of the hairstyle as black self-degradation in his autobiography due to its implications of the superiority of a more, quote, white appearance. And because of the pain the process causes and the possibility of receiving severe burns to the scalp. So it's one of those things that is incredibly divisive and was divisive in the community. Apparently school systems in the United Kingdom have an increase in cases that have been discriminating because of Afro textured hair. So in 2019, five-year-old Josiah Sharp was banned from the playground at break times and eventually sent home from school due to his quote unquote extreme haircut is a basic fade. And he was eventually allowed to return when his hair grew back to what the school deemed to be an appropriate length, which is offensively absurd. Yeah, that's the only way to describe that. That goes back to systemic racism, right? Like that is like under the guise of professional or dress codes, like now somebody is being excluded and it just happened to be a a black student. So it's ridiculous. So in 2018, Jacasia Flanders was a pupil at Fulham Boys School, and he was told that he had to cut off his dreadlocks or leave the school. The school only backed down after his mother launched a campaign supported by the Equality and Human Rights Commission. So good for her for getting in some good trouble. Right. And making sure that that Chikazia didn't have to cut his hair. Getting in good trouble. I like that. Yeah. And also, we we went back and forth trying to pronounce that name. So I hope that we did a, we did it justice. I apologize. Mm-hmm. We looked up enunciations and stuff like that, and I have not been able to find any. So I apologize. All right. You can write in and let us know if, mm-hmm. how to pronounce it correctly. Yeah. Most recently, Ruby Williams came out of a three year legal battle with her school in Hackney, where she had been repeatedly sent home because her natural Afro hair was deemed to be against uniform policy. <sighs> yeah. It's pretty much all we can do at this point. It's an unfortunate thing. And I think one of the reasons that we even wanted to talk about that part was because at the end of the day, it's a ruse. It's a guise. It's absolutely systemic racism just doing the subtle thing, right? It's the subtle thing othering people. It's going, right. you can't you can't be here because your hair doesn't match our standards. And that's an, it's just an easy way to other people. Right now, it's legal in a lot of places, unfortunately. Right. And probably becoming increasingly so. Yes. So anyway, that's, I think, you know, mostly what we have to say about this topic for now. There's plenty to unpack that we didn't get to. We didn't even talk about the fact of like how... In a lot of places, hair care products for black people are the ones that are hidden behind locked glass 
and behind locked cages and that sort of thing where the hair care products for white people are on open shelves right next to it. Mm -hmm. And they'll say it's because those products are more commonly being stolen. And I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that. So there's just a huge amount of things that we didn't get to. We didn't dig into a lot of specific research. So I think go out there, look around, find more, let us know, like, you know, get back to us, tell us what things we probably should have included in this discussion. But there's, there's just a lot, there's a lot to unpack in this topic and a lot to take on and understanding how I think important it is to, to recognize sort of how hair affects how we show up in our culture around us. And actually, I think that's a, a good opportunity for us to segue into our major take home points after we hear a quick message from people who discriminate against hairstyles. Okay, we're back, and I think we have some wrap-ups, some take-home points to talk about. And where I wanted to start was going to this thing of thinking about the reason that we felt like this is an appropriate topic to talk about, not only because we have found that we we have this platform and we can use it to cover political issues that we find are important to us, as we've been doing a lot recently, but also because thinking about the fact that like how someone shows up in their environment... And how that environment receives those people is an important variable and how they then choose to show up in that environment again next time. And so people who are showing up in an environment where they're being told you're bad because your hair looks different from mine are going to have a very different experience and how they even just get up and get ready in the morning thinking, okay, what do I need to do with my hair so that I don't get in trouble going to school, going to work? going out in public. Mm -hmm. What do I need to do? Like what other things am I thinking about that? Nobody else that has, you know, my white counterpart friends are having to think about in terms of, do I straighten my hair? How much time do I have to take? Am I going to be able to get that hair care product that's behind locked doors that I need to be able to purchase so that I can have my hair look a certain way so I don't get in trouble? It's just constant battle after battle. And that takes a toll, you know, that takes a toll in, in stress. It takes a toll in, I think, how you then internalize those struggles and and feel like this is a thing about me that is either good or bad or or I'm a victim or I'm you know some I've done something wrong whatever it is and that's just like <laughs> that sucks that people are finding themselves in that situation but something I think for other people to be aware of that that is an issue that people are facing yeah it's not fair I think that like you bring up a good point and then to like further that point, you know, it's a daily stressor that is, you know, am I going to be able to get this product? Is this going to be available to me? Am I going to be accepted? It also turns into is my hairstyle going to turn me into a target? Oh, right. Like I'm already I'm already a target. And now you've got a systemic racism situation where you've got government bodies and schools trying to control black bodies. And then on top of that, now this person who has their natural hair has become a target for hate groups and stuff like that. And it's, it's a very unfortunate thing for something as simple yet as complex as hair. It's something that I personally have never had to deal with. And I've had the worst hairstyles because I don't give a shit about my hair, <laughs> which is a privilege, which is a privilege. And I yeah. and, and it's important to note. And we recognize that that I've never had to worry about whether I could get hair care products, whether I would find a salon for some like with somebody who could cut my hair. Right. Like I've never had that issue. And I think that like these stressors add to. You know, the overall stressors that that somebody from a marginalized group, especially the black community in the United States is experiencing right now. Exactly. So I think worth pointing out then again is sort of we're we're in our take home point phase of this discussion. There's been a long history of discrimination toward African-Americans and their hairstyles. And then in sort of correspondence to that, there's the natural the natural Arab Afro textured hair that that also then has a corresponding identity and pride amongst the black community and has become a political statement. It also continues to serve as a source of contention and, as you said, sort of paints a target on people in how they decide how they then have to carry themselves and use their hair. And, and, and then, as you pointed out, like I'm, I'm similar that I've worn my hair a lot of different ways and I felt like the worst thing that was going to happen to me was someone and be like, wow, your hair is crazy. Uh-huh. Not that I was going to I was more likely to get pulled over, not that you know I was, I was likely to be discriminated against in other significant ways, but. Yeah, it's a privilege that we have. And so it's important to point out those injustices. 
I think that goes to the idea that there's a lot of work that needs to be done socially, politically, individually to be able to understand and embrace black hair. And I think there are a lot of resources out there that help to provide some insight on the history of discrimination, how politicized this has been. And so it's definitely worth educating yourselves. And we're going to go ahead and share a few books and some resources that are definitely worth picking up. I'm adding these to my reading list as well, so I can educate myself a little bit more. Sure. There's The Hair Story, Untangling the Roots of Black Hair in America by Ayana Bird and Lori Tharps. There's Twisted, The Tangled History of Black Hair Culture by Emma DeBiri in 2020. And then there's Queens, Portraits of Black Women and Their Fabulous Hair by Michael Cunningham and George Alexander. These are different references that are out there, resources that you can pick up and start reading. There's also been some documentaries that Britt recommended here. I have not seen any of these, but I'll take a recommendation that face value for what they are. Good Hair, uh, Chris Rock documentary in 2009, My Nappy Roots, A Journey Through Black Hair, <laughs> Heritage, <laughs> that's a good punny name. <laughs> it's good, I like that. I'm um, from 2010, Napoli Ever After in 2018, Back to Natural in 2019, and Natural Hair, the movie, and also 2019. So some recommendations there from Britt. Yep. And if you all have any recommendations, send them our way. Um, we will be happy to share them. Absolutely. Okay, as I said, this does not cover the entire scope of this conversation, but we've been talking about this for a while. We'll wrap it up there. Please send us any feedback or comments if you would like to. We can help read those things and add to this discussion. We're definitely very happy to hear those. Absolutely. Awesome. I definitely want to say a big shout out to Britt. Thank you for her contribution in putting together the notes for this episode. Mm -hmm. And before we close this out, shall we get to some recommendations? Let's do it. So my recommendation is a series that has come out and it is called Stranger Things. If you have not watched that uh, cultural phenomenon and season four at the time of this recording is out in full volumes one and two are out. I just have to say these kids are incredible. Like the acting in this in this series has just gotten better and better and better. And let me tell you that season four is just the probably I would make an argument the strongest season Man. so far with how the acting is, how the, the storyline, the villain is really good. Man, Vecna is so scary. Yeah. Volume two really brings it home. Like it, it's such it's got such a satisfying end for the season itself. And it leads up to season five in a really nice and satisfying way. It's really raised the stakes. And I'm just I am. I can't stop thinking about it. I've been thinking about it all day. Oh, I thought they were going to wrap it up after season four. Nope. They, oh no, they said there's a very big setup for season five. Oh, okay. Well, in a really I'm, good way, in a really satisfying way, I'll say. Okay. I'm extremely excited. I loved mm-hmm. the first part. So I'm, I'm excited to follow up on that as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Eddie, Eddie is one of my favorite characters. That's great. <laughs> I love it. He's so ridiculous. Okay. I am recommending the recent Pixar Disney joint called turning red (laughs) and so this is sort of a coming of age movie and this is actually fun so this this movie came out in 2022 did you know shane that this is the first solo female directed pixar movie i didn't know that actually i want to say that i might have heard that but i didn't i that didn't stay with me pixar has been operating making movies for over 26 years and this is their very first (laughs) female only directed movie so cool Good. Cool. That that happened. It's about time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great job, everybody. And it was good. It was, it was a really fun, really cute movie. I enjoyed it. I think others will as well. Definitely available on Disney Plus and, of course, other places. So check out Turning Red and Shane's recommendation, Stranger Things Season 4. 100%. Yes. All right. If you would like to support our show, you, as, I, as I mentioned at the top, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flesh this out a little bit more here, you can leave us a rating and review. You can subscribe wherever you get podcasts. You can tell a friend. You can join us on Patreon where you'll get all kinds of bonus things. You get early access to episodes. You get videos of us recording. You can get transcripts of the well, those will be available in other ways, but you can get our notes that we've written for these episodes, that sort of thing. So all kinds of bonus goodies. Plus, it helps us out. It helps us do the show. There's already some people who do that sort of thing, and they're pretty cool. So I'm going to go ahead and list them now. And that includes our supporters that are Amanda, Brad, The Daily BA, Joshua, Justin, Justine, Kim, Kostia, Layla, Megan, Mike, and Mike T, Shauna, and Stephanie. Thank you all so much yes. for your continued help. You're awesome. In addition, you can head to our website and you can pick up some merch there if you feel like you want to, you know, wear clothing that has podcast stuff on it. I do. Yeah. Personally. I do. Oh, also, we have this cool little tote bag there that's got our new logo and it's like great for 
groceries or books or whatever you put in tote bags. Mm -hmm. Go on a picnic, maybe. And then, as I said, please reach out to us. We love to hear it from people. You can reach us on social media. Our handle on all of those is at WWD Podcast. You can also email us at info at www.podcast.com. Check out our website for more things about what we're up to. And I think that's it. I just have special thanks for our team, people who made this happen. Thank you, Britt, for your notes. Thank you, Justin, Selena, Kyle, Allen. And of course, thank you, Shane, for recording with me today. As always. Happy to be here. And of course, thank you all for listening. We would not have this podcast if we did not have you as our listeners. All right. Am I forgetting anything or do you have anything to add before we wrap this up? Nope. I think that's it. Okay. Thank you all for listening. This is Abraham. And this is Shane. We're out. See ya. You've been listening to Why We Do What We Do. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.podcast.com. Thanks for listening. And we hope you have an awesome day.